I, I wear chains. You wear chains. Your mama has chains. Your daddy's got chains. Your daddy's daddy got chains. We all wear these chains, but we act like no one can see my chains. In fact, I bet some of you are sitting next to your very best friend in the world, and you have no idea what their chains look like. Because we, we don't want other people to see our chains, because on one shoulder, the chain is shame. Like someone looked at you, someone said something to you, someone called you a name, someone treated you in some way, and they put a chain on you, and you're just, ashamed, you're just ashamed of it. The other shoulder is guilt, where it kind of was your fault. Like what you did, what you said, where you were, you would do anything to take that moment back, that evening back, that relationship back, but you can't. And so you don't want anybody to see your chains. The problem with chains is they shackle you. Can you imagine trying to play soccer in these things? You'd lose. Can you imagine trying to have a relationship with it? You would lose. Can you imagine trying to be smart, fast, funny? It, like, you are not at your best when you're wearing chains. And we all wear chains. What would you do to drop your chains tonight? Because that's exactly what we're talking about. What would you do what lengths would you go? What sacrifice would you make that you could drop these tonight? Now, would you drop them forever? No, we put them back on. Then we have to sh unshackle ourselves again. But tonight, what if you could walk out of this room tonight free of these chains? The shame that you carry, the guilt that you have, the relationships of your past. Here's my greatest concern with you wearing chains. Is that you will think... <clears throat> That because you have worn these chains, that you will always have to wear these chains. Some of you, God has plans for you that are far beyond anything you could ask or imagine. To bring hope to other people, healing to other people, to lead organizations, to build churches, to invent new things, to make the way easier for your children's children's children, but you will never get to your God-given purpose when you're wearing these chains that were not his purpose for you. You hear what I'm saying? And some of you think that's not even possible because the, like the chains I have, these bad boys are thick. They've been on me for a long time. There's no way these can get off. You are, I'm sorry, you're wrong. If Samantha were here tonight, she would tell you you're wrong. It was about a year ago, conference exactly like this, CIY conference. It was in Pennsylvania. And I had preached, and the students are still all in. I mean, you know how the band comes back and they're worshiping. I went out to the lobby, and I'm kind of waiting for the thing to be over and talk to some of the students. Well, this girl is out there, 16-year-old girl, Samantha. And she came up to me, and there were a few people in the lobby, but she said, hey, I, I'm so glad you're out here. I wanted to tell you my life story, which is exactly what I wanted to hear from a 16-year-old girl at that moment. But anyway, I listened patiently, her story's amazing. Now, looking at her, guys, you, you would like looking at her. She was a very attractive young woman. She had a smile on her face, and she had this, this sparkle in her eye. But around her eyes, you could see the lines of pain from years of abuse. And here's what Samantha told me. From the time she was two till the time she was 12... Her mother had a drug habit that she paid for by selling herself and her daughter as a set to men who were perverted from 2 to 12. Now, she's going to have a lot of counseling to go through, no doubt. But what Jesus had done for her to take off the shackles and chains was incredible. And Samantha told me, I think she would tell you too, I don't know why God allowed her to happen, but I think it has something to do with the fact that he intends me to be stronger than girls who couldn't handle it so that I could walk alongside them 
and lead them out of the pain that they've been in. Is that incredible? That's some of you. That is what God can do through some of you, but not unless you drop the chains. So what I want to do is just kind of coach you tonight a little bit of how you can take off the chains. And the first thing that you need to understand, and I need to say this carefully, somebody else put these chains on you. Now, am I, am I saying that you haven't sinned? No, you have. Part of this, like you added some links to this chain. But somebody started the chain, and they just put it on your neck. I don't know who it was. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a bully. But all of us start the chain by somebody else putting it over our shoulders. And then because we think this chain is me, this is clearly what I deserve. That's a lie we tell ourselves. The reason I have this chain, the reason people look at me like that, the reason I feel this way is because this chain is who I am. It is not your identity. And, and I, I just want you to see, like S Samantha, she, in her early teenage years, she did some terrible things. She made bad choices with drugs and boys and men and you name it, she, she'd made the mistake. And some of you have made some really bad mistakes. But can, but can we understand this? Sin is not just what you do. It is what's done to you. And you respond out of anger or bitterness or fear or shame. Some of the chain you did put on yourself, but a lot of it, somebody else put it on you. Now, what I want you to hear me say is not, you know, well, let's blame somebody else for this. No, here's what I want you to hear you, want you to hear me say. Everybody has chains, and every chain starts with someone else putting it on you, but the chain you wear now doesn't have to be your limitation for the future that God has for you. Are you with me? In fact, if you go back to the Bible, Every great man and woman of the Bible wore a chain. Let me just tell you about one. Have you heard of King David? Like he is the greatest king of the Old Testament. Boy, did he do some stupid stuff. That whole Bathsheba thing, I mean seriously. You heard the story? Like all the boys are out at war. I don't know why David didn't go. Maybe he's getting old. Maybe he's got arthritis. Maybe he's just lazy. I don't know. But he's at his house bored, uh, played some video games in the afternoon. Then he took a nap. He gets up. He looks over his neighbor's fence. And there was, say her name out if you know it, Bathsheba. She be bathing. I don't know. I don't know what possesses a woman in the middle of the day when her husband's out of town to get naked in the backyard. I don't know. Either she's really dumb or pretty evil. I've met both kinds of women. I know they're out there. Bathsheba's out there, and David's looking down and goes, oh, baby. Like, calls her over to the house. They do their thing. Problem was... She got pregnant. I know. So what's a king to do? He calls, her husband's name was Uriah. He calls Uriah back from the battlefield. And he goes, uh, how's the battle? How are we doing? How are the men? How are the troops? How is General Joab? It, he doesn't care about the battle. He cares about covering his tracks. And what he's thinking is, Uriah comes home. He's been on the battlefield. He's tired of smelly men. He's thinking his wife might be pretty good for the night. So David invites Uriah to go sleep with his wife. Uriah didn't. Uriah goes and sleeps on his front porch. David gets up to get the paper the next morning and goes, dude, what are you doing out here? Uriah, way more noble than David, says, how could I go enjoy the pleasures of a home-cooked meal and, you know, when my brothers in arms are in trenches on the battlefield. No way am I going to enjoy the pleasure of my wife when they can't enjoy the pleasure of theirs. And David's just going, oh, stink. I'm a really bad man. So he thinks, i, I got to solve the problem. So he, next night he invites Uriah over to the house, gets him plastered drunk, thinking now he'll, like, he won't make good decisions. He's drunk. 
he made a good decision. Well, he got drunk, but then he wouldn't go home to his wife. And now David goes, what's a king to do? Do you know what he did? He gets out a piece of paper, and he writes a letter to Joab, his general. He says, Joab, I want you to put Uriah on the front lines of battle, at the thickest part of the battle, and I want you to give an order for all the men around him to pull back, leave him stranded there to be killed. He rolls it up, he seals it with the king's signet ring, hands it to Uriah, and Uriah, without knowing it, carried his own death sentence to the front lines of battle. That's pure evil. You know what makes me maddest about that? Uriah was not a Jew. Uriah was a Hittite. This man gave up his family. He gave up his home. He gave up his culture so that he could go fight for the king who he believed in. And the king he believed in betrayed him. He slept with his wife, got her pregnant, and then killed him to cover it up. What an idiot! And yet he's still the greatest king. How is that possible? I mean, the Bible even says that David was a man after God's own heart. How can you be a man after God's own heart and sin like that? Because, listen to me now, this is you. This is me. Being a man or a woman after God's own heart is not the heart you have. It's the heart you're after. And if you want to be a man of God, and you want to be a woman of God, I don't care what shackles you've been wearing. I don't care what chains you've been carrying. You can be that man or that woman, but only if you get rid of these chains. What would you do to drop these chains tonight? Now, I want to I say one more thing about these chains, because it was true for David, and it's true for you. You know what? You know why a lot of men wear these chains? It's because their father put them on them. Now, there's other people who can put them on them. But you wonder, why, why was David like that? Listen, I, I, I taught at Ozark Christian College for 22 years. I've seen a lot of young men and a lot of young women. I, I, I wasn't always perfect at identifying which one had father issues. But I was about 90% of the time, I could look at a guy within 30 minutes and go, yeah, he didn't have a dad who cared. Maybe he didn't know his dad, maybe there was a divorce, maybe his dad died, but I could always tell a young man who had a father wound because he, he shows two signs of a father wound. One is he couldn't control his sexual appetite. Number two, he couldn't control his temper. One or the other or both. And I know a lot of young men struggle with sexual issues, particularly pornography. Now, part of that is biology. I get it. But there are guys steeped in sexual sin because they never had a father teach them touch in appropriate ways. Now, now, ladies, I, I get this about you. You love to touch. You love to hold hands. You go to the bathroom like in a group. I'll never get that. <laughs> like if a guy ever said to me, hey, I'm going to go to the John. You want to come? Uh, no. <laughs> now I want to beat your face with a two-by-four is what I want to do. <clears throat> no. But ladies, I, I'm about to teach you something about guys. Boys actually touch other boys more than girls touch other girls. Now, I, I don't mean anything sexual by that. I mean, like, guys on a football field, it's like, let's bump chess. We, we good game each other. I don't know why. We wrestle. We get each other in a headlock. We, you know, fart in each other's face. We do, like, whatever we do, guys, guys just need to touch other dudes. But here's the problem. If you didn't have a dad who put his hand on your shoulder and said, son, I'm proud of you. If you didn't have a dad who hugged you appropriately and made you feel like you were worthy of being a man, if you didn't have a dad 
that would pick you up in his arms, who would wrestle with you, who would carry you on your shoulders. Men who haven't had appropriate touch from men often seek inappropriate touch from women. And for a lot of guys, pornography is a way of feeling a sense of intimacy without paying the price for a relationship. It's cheap, it's quick, it's dirty. And I just want to say to you guys, man up, because that's not the way to treat a woman. How dare you look at someone else's daughter like a piece of meat. That is someone's daughter that you're looking at. That is someone's daughter that you are lusting over. And until some man gives you his daughter's hand at a wedding altar, you have no right to that kind of touch. Now look, I, I know some of you guys are going to go and say, well, you know, <laughs> she's the one that got naked. She's the one that took the pictures. She's the one that got online. It's not my fault. You know why she did that? Because she's, every woman who is a porn star wears a chain that someone else put on her. How dare you take advantage of a woman burdened by a chain? How dare you do that? She is injured. She is hurting. Can you imagine walking up to the cafeteria, there's a person in a wheelchair, and you just push him off to the side because you can. How dare you go to a blind guy playing the guitar, got his guitar case out, people throw money in. Would you steal from a blind man because you could? Don't do that. Now, ladies, I hear you clapping. I'm about to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Because pound per pound, the meanest animal on earth is a teenage girl. You think guys abuse girls? Look at your social media feed. You are brutal to each other. How dare you take a pot shot at a woman wearing a chain? How dare you? She is a daughter of God. And just as guys act out when they don't have appropriate father touch, girls do too. And I could always tell the girls that didn't have a father who said, I love you, because they would go through a string of boys to get stupid boys to say, I love you, to say you're beautiful, and you never believe it, because they're not your father. We all wear chains, and these chains are going to keep you from your best you. So would you like to know how to get rid of the chains? Are you in? You here? You with me? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read in the Bible. Our, the book we're in is 1 John. I'm going to land in chapter 2. I'm only going to read three verses, and I'm going to give you three steps. All three are essential. You can't miss one step. If you do, you'll still wear your chains. Step number one. My dear children, as I write this to you, I, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I'm going to stop there for a minute. The first solution to releasing your chains is to recognize that you have an advocate. You know what an advocate is? It's like a defense attorney. There's another passage that talks about Jesus as our advocate. It's Romans 8, one of my favorite chapters probably my favorite chapter of the whole Bible. And here's what it says. Down deep, deep inside the chapter, it's talking about how you can be led by the Spirit and you can follow the Spirit. But then he says, Jesus Christ, right now, sits at the right hand of the Father. 
pleading your case because he died for your sins. And some of you think your some of you actually think your sins are bigger than the blood of Jesus. You are out of your mind. Jesus' blood can cover all of your sins. Do you believe that's true? Well, let me let me paint this picture for you because it's one of the best pictures of the New Testament. Imagine that you are taken to court by God. Well, God is the judge. He'd take you to court. Your, your adversary, the devil, actually takes you to court. He is the prosecuting attorney. He has no right, by the way, to accuse you of Jack Diddley. Satan didn't create you. Satan doesn't own you. Satan didn't buy you. Satan didn't redeem you. He has no right to accuse you. But he's going to, and he stands in front of his desk, and there you are on the right-hand side of the courtroom, and you've got a table there, and there's two chairs, one for you and one for your defense attorney. Prosecution starts. Your Honor, Exhibit A, look at the lies that she told. Look at the cheating that she did. Look at, look at the secrets of her bedroom. According to your word, she deserves to be punished. And your defense attorney, I know you'll be nervous because it's all true. Satan's a liar, but he's not lying about that. Your defense attorney will say, uh, objection, your honor. I paid for that one. Oh, that'll, that, that'll just send Satan into a tizzy because he knows that's true too. So he'll raise his voice and say, but your honor, according to your law, I could roll the videotape. This person deserves to die. What kind of a judge are you if you don't keep your own law? And your defense attorney will put his hands on the table and stand to his feet and say, objection, your honor. I paid for that one as well. Uh, that will just send Satan over the edge. He will scream. He will shout. He will identify everything that makes you cringe, both the guilt and the shame. He'll bring it all back up in your face, but your defense attorney, with equal ire, will slam his hands on the desk, stand to his feet and say, Objection, Your Honor. I paid for that one and all the others as well. And I swear to you, by the hand of God, you will hear the gavel come down with a thunderous crash and these words, not guilty. You know it's the 4th of July, right? It's time for some of you to claim your spiritual freedom from these chains. And my suspicion is that the majority of you at some point or another have already accepted the blood of Jesus for your sins. So why are you still wearing these chains? Because, don't hate me when I say this, the blood of Jesus is never sufficient for breaking the chains. It will pay for your sin. It will release you from hell but it won't take off your chains. Look at verse two. First John, two, two. He is the anointing sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. At this at least, this at least means that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to cover every rape, every murder, every theft, every lie, every cheating, every abandonment, every divorce, every sin of every person of all human history, his blood is big enough to cover. But let me talk to you in practical terms what that means. If you don't forgive those who put these chains on you, you'll never get rid of your chains. I want to say that again. If you don't forgive those who put the chains on you, you will never get rid of your chains. Today, I, I, I read an email. There's a woman in our church who's 42 years old. The first time she was abused, she didn't even understand it was abuse. It was her brother and he just started touching her. She was six. It progressed and progressed and progressed. He put a chain on her and she added 
hundreds of links. In her mid-twenties, she came to Christ, and she was forgiven by Jesus of her sin. But it wasn't until she was 35 years old. Many of your mothers are the same age as this woman that I talked to today through email. She was 35 years old before she finally confronted her brother. He confessed his sin. And you know what she learned at 35 years old? He had been abused before he abused her. Your father, if you have a father wound, I guarantee his wound is probably worse than yours. If you've had some arguments with your mother, I guarantee she she wears a chain. The bully at school that treated you like that, that mean girl who wrote those things about you, I guarantee she has chains. And until you can receive the forgiveness of Christ and offer that to others, you will always wear your chain. See, sometimes the forgiveness of Jesus isn't just what heals you. It is your forgiveness that heals your family. The sins of the whole world could potentially be eradicated if we could forgive one another for causing someone else pain because we ourselves were wearing a chain. Is that making sense to you? But even if you forgive the person who hurt hurt you the worst, I'm sure there's stacks of them, but if if you could forgive all of them and even if you could receive the forgiveness of Christ, your chains aren't gonna come off. Because Jesus' forgiveness of you and your forgiveness of others is not enough to release the chain. There is one more step that you need. You need this step. Look at verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. You want these off? then you have to accept Jesus. If you have never accepted Jesus before as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you tonight, he can take these chains off of you. But you also have to forgive those who hurt you. That doesn't mean forgetting. That doesn't mean ignoring. That doesn't mean putting yourself in danger again in an abusive situation. But it does mean that you release the right to bitterness and revenge because you recognize that the person who hurt you had been hurt before hurting you. The third step is is vital, guys. It is obeying the commands of Jesus. And his commands are not burdensome. A lot of people, like Chad was talking about it this morning, they think think that that the commands of God somehow are the shackles. No. Addictions are the shackles. Shame are the shackles. Guilt are the shackles. The, 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 the over, we think, oh, I'm going to be free so that I can have sex with whoever I want. Really? That's a heavy burden to bear. That's a heavy shackle. Some of you know that all too well. I'm, I'm free to say whatever I want. No, that is a burden that you bear. The commands of God and keeping the commands of God will actually set you free from the guilt, the shame, and the chain that you wear. But here's the secret sauce of the night. I have never seen anyone take off their shackles alone. It is in community. It is in confession. It is in support of your small group. And maybe it's just you and a coach or you and a pastor. Maybe it's just you and your best friend. But I've never seen a single person take off their own shackles. It doesn't work that way. Tonight, If you want these released, then you have to walk in community with others. I'm going to have Nate come come up here just so that we have a picture to go on. These chains are weighing you down. You will never be at your best while you're wearing these chains. You'll never get these chains off without a friend walking beside you.